All right, today we're going to be talking about how significant fire weather wind events can impact wildfires. So we're going to be talking about cold fronts, thunderstorms, Santa Ana's, or any other kind of downslope wind, and then also whirlwinds, which you'll sometimes call fire whirls or even fire tornadoes. So I think it should be a pretty interesting kind of learning experience as we go through the information I picked up today in fire in California's ecosystems. So we'll go into cold fronts first. Now the first thing I should say is we don't usually have cold fronts move through California during fire season, but if you do have a cold front and a wildfire at the same time, there can be some pretty interesting interactions where it can increase fire behavior and then also lead to very erratic direction of spread. So the first thing I should probably do is just explain how a cold front works. You may already know this, but you have cold air moving in and that's going to be more dense than the warm air it's replacing. So the warm air is going to be lifted up. A lot of times that'll form clouds, maybe some rainfall. But the key thing that we need, and I guess that could reduce fire danger if you get enough rainfall when this happens. But the key impact that cold fronts can have on wildfires, I would say, is due to the winds. Now, you're going to have a lot of wind around your cold front because you're going from very cold air to very warm air. So you're going to have a large difference in pressure because there's a large difference in temperature and your winds are always going to want to flow from high to low pressure. So just without getting too into the weeds, the larger your temperature difference is over a very short distance, the faster your winds are going to be. And that's exactly what happens on a cold front. You go from warm air to cold air, sometimes in the course of 15 minutes. So you're going to have very strong winds. And that obviously can lead to rapid fire spread for a number of reasons. Can pick up burning embers, create spot fires, provides more oxygen to the flame, can lead to the flames tilting forward and drying out some of the fuels before they even reach them. But what's, I would say, most interesting about what happens with a cold front and a wildfire is the change in wind direction that you'll have. So as the cold front's coming in, you'll typically have southerly winds. Most surfers know this. If a storm is coming into California, you always go to the surf spots that favor a southerly wind, where that, that's the good wind for offshore waves. But this can also have impacts on wildfire. So if you have a southerly wind, that's going to want to push the fire north. But then once the cold front moves through, typically your winds will calm down. Your strongest winds are going to be in maybe the one to three hours before that front is passing and then right when it's passing. But then after it passes, your winds do typically calm down, but they also change direction. So they'll be more maybe westerly or northwesterly, which would act to push your fire maybe southeasterly. So you go from your fire moving north to all of a sudden your fire is almost moving in the exact opposite direction. So you can imagine the challenge that would have if you're a somebody fighting the fire and the fire maybe all day has been going one direction and then the cold front moves through and all of a sudden the fire's moving up in a completely different direction and you maybe thought you were in a safe position but now you're in a very dangerous position so very important impacts there i imagine that would be a difficult thing to forecast as well so cold fronts maybe rare but could have some extreme impacts if you do have that combined with a wildfire. Now let's go to something maybe a little less rare in California, which is thunderstorms. First thing I think about is 2020, where we had Tropical Storm Fausto off of the kind of Mexico, California coast, funneled in a bunch of moisture. And then with all that moisture, a lot of times you need some lifting factor as well. So then that moisture lifted up, created hundreds of thunderstorms all over the state which led to hundreds of fires and what is arguably the worst wildfire year in recorded history, or at least recent history. Uh, yeah, we'll say recent history because you could definitely argue, argue that the Peshtigo fire, which I think was way back in the 1800s, was far worse than anything we saw in 2020 because I think maybe two to 3,000 people died in that fire, but that's maybe a story for another video. So thunderstorms, 
when you have them in California, it can impact wildfire in a number of ways. Now, it's typically going to be maybe in your more mountainous areas because that's where you're going to have that lifting mechanism. And you need that lifting mechanism to form the thunderstorms in most cases. And the three impacts this can have. If you get rainfall, you get some winds, and you get some lightning. So we'll just go... I think the best way to go over this is to go through the stages of a thunderstorm. So as the thunderstorm is first forming, that's going to be the cumulus stage. It's developing. And this is where you mostly just have updrafts. And as the name sounds, it's more of just like a cumulus cloud. But it's rapidly growing and getting taller and taller. The reason for that, we actually talked about this in a previous video. It's the opposite of sweating. So when you sweat, you have a liquid droplet on your arm, and then when that evaporates, it takes some energy from the environment around it, which is your body, so it steals heat from your body and cools you down through evaporation. The opposite happens in this cumulus stage, where we have rising air getting colder, so then as it gets colder, can't hold as much water vapor, so then some of that water vapor is going to condense into liquid droplets. So like in sweating, we're going from liquid to water vapor, and it was stealing heat from the environment. In this case, we're going from water vapor to liquid, and we're adding heat to the environment. So if you have warmer air in your cloud as it's rising up, then it's going to be less dense, and it's going to want to continue to rise. So that's why thunderstorms can get so tall until they, in some cases, reach the top of the troposphere and have that very kind of cool-looking anvil shape at the top. So at that stage, it's what you'd call the mature stage. So you have updrafts, but then here's when you're also going to start to see some downdrafts. And your downdrafts will start when precipitation starts. It makes sense that when your rain starts falling out of the cloud, it's because you no longer only have updrafts holding all that rain in your cloud. And then what's also going to happen, just going back to our little sweat example, if you have high base thunderstorms, some of those liquid droplets, if not most of them, are actually going to evaporate before they get to the ground. And that's what you call virga. And then, just like in the sweating example, if you're going from liquid to water vapor, that's going to cool the atmosphere down, it's going to make it more dense, and then that's going to intensify that downdraft motion. So this is where you can have some pretty large impacts on wildfire behavior, where you not only have your in, I think it's called indraft winds. So that's the air sucking up into the thunderstorm. So it'd be coming from one direction. <laughs> no, no pun intended. Don't, I don't listen to that band, trust me. Um, and then on the backside of the thunderstorm, you're going to have stronger downdraft winds. And then you can imagine the impacts that has on wildfire. It's a quick change in wind direction. And then those strong downdrafts can also lead to very erratic fire spread for usually the good news is it's not a very long period of time, maybe 10 to 20 minutes, but it can impact fires within a few miles of that thunderstorm. So while it's in this mature stage, this is also typically when you'll have lightning. You know the impacts that has on wildfire. Now, most lightning strikes don't lead to fire, but occasionally some do. It's usually more in the upper elevations. And then, obviously, that's a problem because it leads to new fire ignitions. And if you have lots of thunderstorms all at the same time, you can get a bunch of fire or wildfires popping up into what we'd call a complex, but it just makes it very difficult for firefighting resources. And then, finally, during this stage, with the downdrafts, maybe some of that rain finds its way into the ground. Usually, I'd say thunderstorms don't have a huge impact on fire danger from bringing moisture into your fuels. Or at least I'm saying that based on what I've read in fire in California's ecosystems. But if you get enough rain, obviously that would help to reduce fire spread. But up in the higher elevations, that's typically where you're going to have trees. And if you have trees, you need to pick up a quarter of an inch to a half an inch to really bring a lot more moisture into your fuels and reduce the risk of wildfire. And thunderstorms can move so quickly that it's hard to pick up a half inch that quickly. But yeah, if you do, that helps with fire danger. So then finally, you have the dissipating stage where it's just downdrafts and the thunderstorm basically falls apart. 
So I think that sums up thunderstorms. Now let's go on to the one that I actually don't know how to pronounce. I, I looked up a couple YouTube videos and each one was pronouncing it differently. So I'm going to go with the one that I believe I remember from graduate school when I was studying under the Fire Weather Research Laboratory, and that was fern winds. Now, just so I don't have to say fern again, if that's the correct way to, spe to say it, it's spelled F-O-E-H-N, but you probably know these by the more common names. In Southern California, it's going to be Santa Ana's. In Santa Barbara, it's going to be the Sundowners. In Northern California, we often call these Diablo winds. And it's downslope windstorms. And typically in California, these will be offshore, except maybe the northern and western Sacramento Valley, where it could be a bit more northerly. So, so most of these are going to be easterly offshore wind events. So what happens here, and I'll get into why this is important for wildfire, but first the explanation, you have a mountain range. On one side of the mountain you have a high, on the other side of that mountain you have a low. Winds like to flow from high to low pressure, so it's going to flow up, in some cases over the Sierra, and then down the, or just down slope. Now here is where it's almost the opposite of the rain shadow effect. During the rain shadow effect, You'll have air rising. As it rises, it cools, forms some clouds, you get some rainfall. But if your winds are going downslope, it's going to heat up, and then that warm air can hold more water vapor, so then it's also going to dry out. So right off the bat, you're checking two of the boxes for fire weather, like extreme fire weather conditions. It's going to be hot and dry. And then on top of that, it's also going to be quite windy. And this is especially true in Southern California where you have the Santa Anas. You're not only going to have that downslope flow, but then you're also going to have that wind funneled through canyons. And then that's almost just like putting your thumb over the edge of a hose or the, the nozzle of a hose. And then the water starts coming out a lot faster. That's what happens to the Santa Ana winds as they're funneled through canyons. A lot of times this is in very dry vegetation as well. So if you have a spark there, your fire can just take off. Now, the good news in Southern California, though, is once the winds stop, usually that just diminishes your fire activity fairly quickly. So a lot of these will be storms or downslope windstorms or fires that pop up, have a lot of growth really quickly, and then die down. So in Santa Barbara, you call them sundowners. That's actually going to be, I believe, more of a northerly wind going down. And that's led to some big fires in the past. And then in Northern California, it's very well named the Diablo winds. So what's interesting, or I shouldn't say interesting, maybe it's the reason they're called Diablo winds is these can be especially dangerous in terms of wildfire, not just because it's hot, dry, windy conditions, but because these events usually peak overnight. So big part of the reason for, so the reason that's dangerous is if your most extreme fire activity is overnight, that's when people might be asleep, they might not know to evacuate, and then the fire can just surprise people. And unfortunately we have seen this play out on a number of different downslope wind event fires in California's history. So it's most intense at night, which is, of strange for wildfire behavior. Usually wildfire behavior is strongest during the afternoon, but it makes sense if you think of upslope winds. So I actually talked about this yesterday, but valley winds happen because in the afternoon your mountain slopes heat up more than the valley, so you get rising air, and then your wind will rush up from the valley to replace that air, so your winds are going upslope. So in the afternoons, you're going to have some of that upslope wind kind of balancing out that downslope flow. And then overnight, you're actually going to have the mountain slopes cooling off more. So then you have some air rushing down into the valley already because it's dense. So it's almost the double whammy where you're combining the downslope flow with the opposite of valley winds, maybe down valley winds, if you want to call them that. So that's, that's maybe makes sense why in Santa Barbara they call them sundowners. 
because the sun goes down and then you start to see these events. And I remember I almost did my master's thesis on this before I got into machine learning and predicting extreme wildfire events. But I remember with the sundowners reading some of the papers where it would be 60 degrees in Santa Barbara. And then over the course of an hour, it would be 100 degrees. And in some of the worst fires, people would be going into the ocean to try to escape the flames. So, yeah, downslope winds, fern winds, Santa Ana, sundowners, Diablo winds, whatever you want to call them and however you want to pronounce it, uh, can lead to some very extreme wildfire behavior in California. So finally, let's talk about whirlwinds. I remember the first time I saw what you could call a fire whirl was when I went to Utah for a prescribed burn with the Fire Weather Research Laboratory. It was an amazing event. There was basically a helicopter lighting a mountainside on fire with just a giant smoke plume that reached up to the stratosphere. All for science, of course, and promoting a more native environment. Um, but while we were on this fire, I remember seeing my first fire whirl. So it almost looks like a mini little tornado of fire. Pretty interesting to see. It happens usually in unstable environments where maybe you have a lot of surface heating where your ground heats up, that heats up the air, becomes less dense, and then it rises up. That was most likely what was happening in Utah that day because I remember it being pretty warm out there. Or this can happen just from the heat of the fire itself. The fire is so hot it heats up the air, that rises, and then in both of these cases as the air is rising, it turns into a vortex. Now, I actually remember being on this fire with Neil LaRoe. He's one of the top wildfire scientists in the world. And I asked him, like, what, why, why is it turning into a vortex? Like, what's the dynamics going on there? And luckily, he's, I'm pretty sure he's an expert in this field. But what he explained is that when you have the rising air, you have air rushing in at the surface to take the place of that air. But unless everything's perfect, some of that air is going to be rushing in at different speeds. So if you have air from one side rushing in faster than air at the other side, it's just going to start to lead to that natural circulation. And then when you start rising that circulation up, it turns into your fire whirl. Now, you've probably seen this on TV at some point. It's very visual. But in the most extreme cases, we can even call them fire tornadoes. And we have seen this on a number of fires where the fire world grows into what you could call a large fire tornado. These can sometimes last for hours, have tornado strength winds. And I probably don't need to explain the damage you can get from that because it's basically a wildfire combined with a tornado. So you have strong winds, you have the fire activity, and then it can also pick up burning branches and throw that out ahead of the fire and lead to some new spot fires. So yeah, definitely don't want to mess around with fire world or definitely don't want to mess around with fire tornadoes. That's going to be one of the most extreme things that we do see in wildfire. So, or at least that's what I've learned so far. I do still have a lot to learn in fire in California's ecosystems. So if you learned something throughout the course of this video and you want to learn more as well, as well as hopefully watch me become better at communicating this information, uh, you can stay tuned and thanks for watching.